All right, we're bringing on Andreas Hale. He is the senior editor of Combat Sports for the Sporting News and his own, and the co-host of his own podcast, The Corner Podcast. And something else I saw that made me super jealous, which is he uh, he's he's written an article for LL Cool J's Rock the Bells website. Also, one of the most powerful and creative voices right now with what's going on in the world. Andreas, thanks for joining, hey, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So I think. If uh, people who listen to this show, where they would have seen you, um, if they, if they are not following you on social media or whatever, where they would have seen you and heard you most recently would have been the podcast with The New Day uh, several weeks back. That was literally one of the most powerful and moving podcasts that, that I've heard in a long time. And I know you have a relationship with those guys, but how did that podcast come to be? Well, yeah, so me and Biggie have been friends for a while. And, uh, you know, through this, this whole ordeal with uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and everything that's going on, we've been just conversing uh, just about the situation at hand. And I, I know he's given me a lot of credit for helping him, you know, with like the legal process and just kind of enlighten him to things. Um, and then he just had the idea was like, you know, I think you should be on the show with us to really talk us through this, to not just be a really emotional show, even though it turned out to be that way, but to also talk about steps moving forward, not to be an angry show, but to be a frustrated show, uh, you know, with the, with the terms of this country and, and the racial climate. And uh, it was really the first time that the WWE has really tackled the subject of race head on. Um, and as a longtime pro wrestling fan, you know, with me hosting a, a panel called Wrestling with Stereotypes at StarCast, it was an honor for me to do something like that. So... You know, uh, I've been to Wale Mania with those guys. I've, you know, supported them, you know, obviously at WrestleMania with Kofi Mania. So it meant a lot to be a part of that conversation and just to really anchor it down as the, the guys just kind of express themselves. So you mentioned the, the panel uh, at, at StarCast, and that's actually when I briefly met you. And you probably don't even remember. We have a common friend, Danny Acosta, and he was he was telling me about about your show and Going back, I was able to to watch it and 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 see the topics that that were coming on. And so, you know, you you guys have been sort of ahead of this uh, the whole time um, as far as uh, how it relates to pro wrestling. But what was behind that project? And people can find that it's on it's on YouTube. The whole conversation and the panels on YouTube. But like, how did that whole project get shaped? And like, what what's the overall goal coming out of that? Well. A while ago, I've always talked about having this conversation because being a longtime pro wrestling fan who grew up, you know, watching Nation of Domination and not understanding why they were heels and not understanding the stereotypes because the egregious stereotypes in pro wrestling for minorities were always the heel roles. And it made me think as I got older, it's like, well, why are, why are we still having these things, you know, um, 15, 20, 30 years into this business when everything else is changing, but pro wrestling really has it. And ultimately, the like Booker T losing the Triple H at WrestleMania was a sticking point for a lot of people. And as I worked in the music business, I started meeting more people, more minorities who love pro wrestling and shared these same thoughts. So as I started my podcast with Kel Dansby of the Corner, which is basically a hip hop and African American perspective on combat sports, um, I came across Conrad at Royal Rumble, and I mentioned this idea to him, and he sat there. And I mentioned also that I said, you know, the first Starcast. While it was great, it was lacking melanin. There were not a lot of my <laughs> African Americans hosting panels or having conversations on this very important topic. And he thought about it. And he's like, "Yeah, it was a blind spot. You know, it wasn't something that I purposefully did not uh, tend to. It was something that needed to be brought to my attention." So, you know, I pitched the idea to a few wrestlers. I wasn't sure who was going to respond. Who, for the first one, and it went over pretty well. And you know, guys like X Pac and. You know, a few other pro wrestlers kind of championed it. So for the next star cast in August, uh, you know, we got to be on a bigger stage. And Conrad called me when, when Moxley dropped down and was like, look, I want to boost you guys to the main event. And I said, sure. So the overall goal was to kind of tell the stories of pro wrestlers, minority pro wrestlers who have been in this business and the hurdles that they've had to overcome. Um, whether that be about race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, there have always been these hurdles, and especially for people like that are African Americans, it was never the cool thing to do to be a pro wrestler. You know, for the most part, where we grew up, it was about other sports. The same thing with like MMA. It was never cool to be a wrestler because of the tights. So 
I wanted to explore those conversations and have people tell those stories. And I give a ton of credit to all the wrestlers that we had involved because some of those stories are truly heartbreaking and some of the stereotypes that they were saddled with and some of the angles that they were put into and the things that they had to say no to. So my overall goal is hopefully to see people that there's another side because you can't attack racism head on with hate and anger and frustration all the time. Sometimes you just have to talk people through these things and make them see a perspective that they may not even even know that existed. Was there anything that came out of that conversation that you learned about others' perspectives that they, they didn't they didn't see your perspective? And, and you know, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because I am a mixed race. And when I was watching wrestling, I didn't really see anybody who would have looked like me because, you know, I am half Mexican. You had a Tito Santana, which, you know, there there was stereotypes about Santana and his moves and making jokes about him. And then on the other side, I'm, I'm half Japanese. So it was always throwing the salt and Mr. Fuji and stuff like that. So as I'm growing up, I, I, I didn't know anybody who really looked like me. So I guess I didn't really look for one because I didn't I, I knew that there wasn't going to be one. But, you know, you've mentioned in the past, you know, I, I don't see anybody who necessarily looks like me or I could see myself in growing up and watching wrestling. But doing that whole panel, was there any other perspectives that came out of that where, you know, maybe you were enlightened about other people's perspectives as well? Yeah, I mean, talking to Nyla Rose, especially, uh, you know, the things that she had to deal with being a transgender uh, pro wrestler. And, you know, it opened your eyes. And I know there were some people that actually cried in the crowd when she was kind of telling her stories because you can't imagine how hateful that some people are. You do to a degree. But, you know, as a black man, it's easy for me to see a black perspective because I've lived it. But Nyla Rose's perspective is one who I just I couldn't fathom how people were so hateful towards this individual. And so she was one in particular, um, you know, people like Scorpio Sky telling stories about being in, the, in ghetto pro wrestling and then wanting him to wear Timberlands and speaking slang and knowing if you've talked to Scorpio Sky, that's not him at all. Uh, but those were just really enlightening. Some of the things we knew, but just to hear them tell their stories was something that was like soul nourishment It was for a lot of people. It was things that you heard about, but you need to hear them to believe that they can be true. Dave, did you have a question? Well, I mean, like one thing, um, you know, and, and I guess that I've kind of like learned a little bit, uh, you know, um, from it was actually the, in the article a couple of weeks ago in The Observer where one of my friend's daughters um you know, his, his boyfriend's her her boyfriend's black, and she had you know until she was twenty four. I don't think that she had ever had a relationship with someone who was black, and she was she essentially wrote about the difference in her life, and kind of there's sort of a there was sort of a real ugliness to the reaction, and I never saw that, and and, and I thought it was you know it was actually it was um, it really hit me hard because it was like this is somebody who in in a weird way you say has seen two worlds and they should be the same world and they're absolutely different worlds and that's you know something that i mean you kind of hear it but you know and i was actually when 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 you guys did the podcast with the new day and i was listening to some of the stuff that i know biggie was really uh you know more and more frustrated as the show went on but austin um you know just you know one of the deals with austin to me is always like you know, he, you know, I mean, he's a brilliant guy. He got a master's degree, you know, all that stuff that we all aspire to be. So I thought that, you know, it was like, well, he worked his ass off and he's really smart. And and I know that anyway, I know that going in, but just to see the, I don't know, his frustration or bitterness of, of the idea that even, even at that, he always felt he had to work much, much harder than the other person. And he still, you know, you could still feel the frustration of, it was, you know, even with that, it's still not equal. And I, I, it's, you know, again, that's a perspective that I could never have. You know, we all have different perspectives, but it was really, um, you know, it's, 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 it's something that I just had never seen. And then, like, you know, it's really been like kind of a crash course in a lot of ways in the last month of, you know, everything from the, you know, unfairness of the system to certainly on the, police standpoint i mean you know you get the example after the example after the example and it's um but it, it hit home obviously because i think the video started it and then it just kind of opened the pandora's box 
So, um, you know, I, it did, you know, I, it's like, I don't, how I say it. Um, I have always known things were never equal for minorities in this country. There's, that's something we all grow up knowing, but I don't know that I realize the systematic nature of it and how, how completely unfair it is. And it was it kind of made me reevaluate a lot of my own thought process on the subject, you know, that, you know, it, it's, I don't know. It's just kind of like my last month or so among all the other issues we had to deal with. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's an interesting thing because, and, and Andreas, I'd love to hear your take on this, which is there are a lot of people who are becoming enlightened to these biases that they have held for their entire life. And they feel depressed and really terrible about them. And and there are other cases where people are just flat out defiant about about the fact. But, you know, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be like this. But it, it, it almost took the, the George Floyd situation for people to really open their eyes uh, around uh, police brutality and unfairness with minorities again. And I feel like we've had these moments over the, you know, because of the cameras now with an iPhone where you can actually get video of what's been going on. But I mean, have you talked to people who have, have reached out and said, you know, uh, you guys have enlightened me, you know, that podcast enlightened me to stuff that I didn't even realize I had as far as biases. And, you know, also there there was the Twitter uh, post that you had made about, um, and, and I saw MVP, I saw New Day give their examples of the first time that you understood what racism was. And I'm sure a lot of people became enlightened out of that as well. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with the, your last uh, point first is, you know, when I was talking to the New Day on that podcast, you know, one point I wanted to make very clear is that our frustration didn't start with George Floyd or our frustration didn't start with Trayvon Martin or our frustration didn't start with Rodney King. It started when we were kids and were completely innocent to the idea of race, because, like I said, hate is a taught language as it, all children just kind of love each other. They don't look at biases. So that's where that tweet came from, because I wanted people to see that a lot of this stuff begins in school, your teachers, your fellow students, and they're taught this behavior. And you carry that burden with you your whole life. And as it manifests, as you get older and you see instances of race, uh, racist acts or police brutality, you get frustrated because nobody's doing anything about it. So the George Floyd thing was like shaking the, the soda and finally it burst and people have had it. But I've had so many people come to me and said, I didn't know. And I appreciate that when people say I didn't know and they're just saying, you know, if you're ignorant to it, there's nothing wrong with that because it's not your experience. But if as long as you're opening to listening to these stories, because they hurt. And that's the hard part for a lot of people is they hurt because we didn't plan for our lives to be this way. We didn't plan to be discriminated against. I mean, listen, I grew up, my grandmother was an old Italian, semi-racist white woman, and she raised me. My parents didn't raise me. And we went to the garden when I was a kid, and she loved Bob Backlund. She loved Ivan Putski, and she liked Junkyard Dog. But then when she saw the Nation of, Dacian, Nation of Domination, she booed the hell out of them. And she said it was ridiculous, and why would they do this? And for me, as me coming as a, to an enlightened black man in this country, I was like, well, Grandma, like, what, why would you feel this way? And she was like, well, you're one of the good ones. And that mm. hurt me. Yeah. Because I was like, what does that mean? Because what does that mean for my friends? What does that mean for the people that you haven't met? So I, I think people need to hear these stories because it's like we, as most minority wrestlers, we, I mean, most minority wrestling fans or most minorities, period, we don't grow up biased to anybody. We are introduced to racism in a really hurtful way that tells you that you're not equal and you can't do something just because of the color of your skin. So fortunately, through these panels and through these conversations, and I've done this through combat sports and I've done this my entire career with like entertainment journalism, all I've ever wanted is for us to be equal. I don't want us to have special benefits. Even the, you know, talking about on real estate, they're gonna get rid of the master bedroom. That doesn't solve anything. It sounds good in theory, but it's, it's not. What, all we want is to be acknowledged and recognized like, listen, Racism exists, stereotypes are exploited, and we need to do something about that in this country. So hopefully the more that we have these conversations, the more people can understand 
that it's not people just yelling, you're racist and you're hateful. It's people trying to make people understand where we're coming from. I mean, in, in pro wrestling, I mean, in having gone through like literally 50 years of evolution in pro wrestling, um, you know, the plight of minorities has changed. I have always felt wrestling was decades behind the times, and I think it's still behind the times, uh, for sure behind the times. Um, but I mean, I've watched this, you know, if, if, if you were to watch it in the 70s, whether it was, I mean, it was, and it was different, different kinds of stereotype in the, in the South, Southeast, um, it was really blatant, ugly at certain points, although the black wrestlers were usually portrayed as the baby face and it was, you know, the heels would use the race to become heel. So it was not glorifying it by any means, but it was a huge part of the presentation. Whereas out here, uh, you could never get away with what they did there. So when I first would watch, when I first started watching the, the you know, um, tapes in the eighties, it used to really bother me watching that portrayal because here, but here we had a different stereotype. You know, it was, um, it was not an uh, ugly, it was, but it, it, it was a stereotype. It was a certain thing. It was, you know, um, just, uh, how would I say? It? But, but it, you know, it was, it was a stereotypical role for sure. Um, and it was designed to be, and now we don't have that in particular, but we're still, you know, I think now a lot of it may just be, uh, when, when you talked about it in the sense of, you know, people who grew up without role, without as many role models, perhaps would may have gotten interested in other things, even though wrestling has always tried to market to minorities, um, you know, just because, historically minorities have supported wrestling um higher than average so it's but it's a, it's a it's it's changed I, I think in some ways it's better but um you know and 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 a lot of that also has to do with with the audience i think the audience is better um i i would even go so far as say it's much better it's a it's a much more enlightened audience today not you know as compared to you know, when I think back on the wrestling audience of 30 years ago or 50 years ago and some of the stuff that I heard that you would never hear in the crowd now and in, in the very rare occasion that you do, everyone in the crowd absolutely just gets furious at something that, you know, back in another generation was every night, 20 times a night on any show anywhere in the country type of uh, words that were used and, and reactions. So I, I guess this sort of this next thing that I was going to talk about kind of relates to what you were talking about, Dave, and I'd love both of your perspectives on this. But some of the biggest stars in wrestling were Caucasian males. Yes. Who imitated Dusty Muhammad Ali and embraced African-American culture, Dusty maybe superstar even to an extent to an extent cause, superstar cause hogan is, is a byproduct yeah hogan and austin isle are byproducts of superstars so yeah and and they used uh you know a, a platform that muhammad ali sort of created to get themselves over as white males and and this is you know this is nothing new you know elvis it also did the same thing with me with music and it, it's just you know it's, it's just a historical thing but for both of you, and I, I, you know, maybe get on Andres's uh, point of view first. But like, as you're as you're watching these guys, like, do you see uh, as a kid? Do you see like, oh, they are using um, African American culture for their own characters while being white guys, essentially? Yes, um, you know, and a very acute observation. I mean, we could talk about John Cena. You know, the rise of John, John Cena. Cena yeah. Uh, yeah, initially, you know, I, I was a fan because he could actually rap. And, you know, he wore throwback jerseys and the shorts and the hats. And you looked at it and you were like, wow. And I was like, this is really cool, but could a black wrestler get over doing the same thing? And that was always the question. And, you know, you go back and you look at, you know, the trash talking. Yes, a lot of people ate from Muhammad Ali. But the thing that's different, it's the same thing with like Eminem and hip hop, is it a certain crowd connected with that white face doing that more than they would have a black face. And it was something that I acknowledged and recognized. And it, and it sucks because the progress is there, but it's been incredibly slow for people to come around to seeing 
um, black wrestlers doing the same thing. Even with The Rock, when he joined the nation, and I was a huge fan of Farouk's promo uh, with Vince Thomas, there was never a black wrestler, but the crowd booed. He cuts that promo today, probably everybody cheers. But as The Rock progressed, he became more and more racially ambiguous, which, which was a testament to saying, maybe the crowd isn't ready for a pro-black or a, a, a prideful black wrestler, even if they don't use those tropes like hip hop or trash talking, maybe this country wasn't ready. But I, I don't know who to blame that more so on the audience or the writing room or Vince and his observations, the stereotypes and, and African-Americans of pro wrestling. But it's always been there. I mean, it's, it's just a thing that black culture is American culture. And for, unfortunately, in some cases, the, the top stars that have been pushed have been Caucasian males using remnants of black culture to get over and other black wrestlers couldn't do the same thing. Do you have any thoughts about that, Dave? Um, it's, it's, it's hard for me to have like, uh, great thoughts on that. Um, it, it, you know, again, because especially because of like with the history of wrestling, it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing. And, um, you know, the way bookers kind of would protect the stars and things like that. Um, and just the mentality, you know, and it's just not just blacks. I mean, it, it's it's, um, you know, I mean, there's a there's a similar situation with Mexicans. It, it's different, but absolutely similar, you know, in, in the sense of the way they were portrayed. And even, you know, even you know what was it, the mexicals remember that it's like mm -hmm. it, it, it was it was like you know you took some really talented guys and that was the gimmick and it's kind of like and they're doing it for in theory for a non-mexican audience yet at the time you know because of Rey mysterio and eddie guerrero and others um the skew of uh, latino audience was gigantic for wwe at that time and yet you still had those uh you know you know, white person stereotype portrayals of Mexicans on the television show, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it's it's been it's been slow. But wrestling's you know, wrestling's always been, um, you know, in its own weird way, a demographic based business in the sense of when I started following it, it was you had certain demographics and you wanted characters to fill the demographics on your baby face side so they could draw from whatever the demographics are of the region that you're in i mean and that's just how it was how it was done um because they were just looking for money you know and from from the widespread i mean it was like i i, I don't i mean it was it was it was certainly uh what's the word i'm you know um what's the word i'm looking for um the hiring was, you know, there was there was hiring based on certain, I guess, quotas. Is quotas the right word? I, I think that's the right word. Hiring was based on certain quotas, um, based on what, you know, the audience was, and also of uh, what the perception of the promoter was of his fans. You know, some promoters had higher perceptions of their fans, and the higher perceptions would you know, not allow them to do certain things that other promoters who had low perceptions of the fans would try to exploit. So that's kind of like how the, 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 the business was then. And, you know, now, even now, but even now, even now, like, uh, it's, it's a worldwide, it's, it's, it's the same thing on a worldwide basis. I mean, WWE is working hard and, 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 and on certain ethnic groups, but the ethnic groups they're working hard on that they really want Again, it's not it's not a matter of progression, but it's a matter of dollar bills in the sense that they really want a Chinese superstar, which, of course, has been very difficult to make because nobody in China grew up with wrestling. So you got to start and no, there's no real great independent scene in China. So you got to start people from scratch. And they're so far behind, you know, in, in development of, of Americans that worked on the indie scene. And also because of the money coming in, they want, you know, a Middle East star. Um and, you know, so so that's kind of like the goals right now is where the money is, you know, as a, so, you know, it's kind of how wrestling's, you know, wrestling's always been what the promoter thinks will draw them the most money. I don't think that it's ever been um, 
you know, like someone will turn down the money because he's a racist, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, I, I, I suppose there were promoters who were like that because that's just natural. But I think that most of them is, you know, I think most of them were really all about money. You know, there's certainly no moral thing of portrayals. It was just what what will drive the most money to, you know, for my shows. And that was the formula that they chose. And it could be, you know, um, it could be a hurtful it could be a hurtful formula. But the idea also was was to incite all fans against the heel. So the heel could, you know, I mean, you know, I've never seen a racist baby face. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when they've used it, it's 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 um, it's to incite people. But it, I always felt very uncomfortable with the use of racism in the heels because for heat, for, it's just for, for heat, for, for heat, because even though it's portrayed as bad and it is, it's still also portrayed as acceptable, acceptable bad, if you know what I'm saying. And that's and it's, it shouldn't be acceptable bad. Well, I mean, both of you will will know this because it's still sort of happening. But, you know, the trying to sell uh, to what people think will sell. This is why we have we have constantly had the great white hope in boxing. Right. Because boxing is predominantly uh, African-American or international rather than, you know, a, a white sport with, with the superstars. And you were, the, you know from Jerry Cooney to Tommy the Duke Morrison trying to find that white heavyweight champion to sell to the Dwayne, masses. Dwayne, because do you remember they think, Dwayne Bobbick or was he before your time? I do remember him, yes. The thing that you know I think about in, in, in the year 2020, and it's been like this for a while, which is the person who I think of as the most popular American athlete is LeBron James. And LeBron James himself is not in the same vein as Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was all about not... Uh, making anybody angry. He wanted everyone to sort of be able to, uh, you know, he wanted to be, be able to make money for everybody with his brand. Uh, and that's not shade with Michael Jordan. That was just kind of what he did or, or uh, at the time. But LeBron is not like that. LeBron is very vocal about what he believes in. And so to me, the idea of a great white hope is so outdated because it's very clear that LeBron James is the most popular athlete. So who are you trying to find? I'd rather find another LeBron James or another person just based on what you could you what you could promote rather than specifically looking for this uh, for this one person. Uh, do, do you have uh, Andres? Do you have any thoughts about that? Because I know you cover boxing as well, and that is just prolific in, in the sport of boxing, trying to find that, that Histor person. historically, not as much. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's as much now, but yeah. So I'll say this because it, it's kind of like this multifaceted approach with, with finding the great white hope. And I'll even re relate this to MMA as well with Dana White and how he chooses to promote certain fighters. Um, I think it starts with the storytelling, whether that's in pro wrestling's writer's room and creative, whether that's in boxing with the marketing and PR teams, or on the other side with the reporters and journalists telling these stories. Um, it's easier to tell a story that you're familiar with. And that, that a lot of people fall into the same trope of telling a certain story about a black fighter or a white fighter. And it's easy. They believe it's easier for people to relate to that narrative. In boxing, the black story has often been, I grew up in poverty, I boxed my way out of the ghetto, and now I'm rich. And then in Floyd Mayweather's case, it's like, now I'm going to play up this heel role to make everybody hate me because you want to pay to see me lose rather than to see me win. That's an easy story to tell, but it's also mm -hmm. very lazy. Um, I think in pro wrestling also, it's if you're a white man it, having a promotion with white pro wrestlers, it's easier to tell those stories because you kind of understand them. And the ones that you don't understand, either you don't want to tell them because you're not familiar or you're just not interested in pushing that narrative because you believe that your audience, this is what they want. And in MMA, it's kind of the same thing with Dana White, with Sage Northcutt and Paige Van Zandt, and even to a degree, Conor McGregor. Those are easier uh, fighters to market because Dana White can kind of relate to them. But where it comes to somebody like Tyron Woodley, who was arguably on a, a tremendous welterweight title run, Dana didn't really get along with him or understand that narrative, even though Tyra Woodley was in Ferguson, which was a very easy story to tell that people could have related to. But it, it, it comes from 
all you need to have, I, I guess you put it real simple. You need to have more black people in your writer rooms and your editing rooms and your creative rooms. You need to have somebody there to say, no, that's not a good idea. Or yes, this is a great idea and this is how we should tell it. Because it, the, the great white hype is a lazy narrative because you're trying to force it when it doesn't exist. It should be fair to a white fighter if he's an amazing fighter to just be an amazing fighter. They shouldn't ever have to say there's a great white hype. It should just be, he happens to be white and he's a really, really good fighter. And in boxing, that comes in the form of somebody like Caleb Plant, who's an exceptional fighter. But I don't need anybody telling me that he's a great white hype. And I understand it comes with marketing and PR, but it's lazy. And we really need to stop relying on those really lazy uh, ways of telling stories to try to get people over. It doesn't work. So, you know, you talked about the writer's room and, and, and representation, but how much of that even matters when in both instances uh, you have one person pretty much calling the shots? Now, you know, a lot of people well, in, uh, in, in, in fighting, you know, it's different from wrestling because in wrestling, you're 100 percent or maybe not 100 percent, but 85 percent calling the shots because you still have the fans, you know. And I mean, the fans can can change the storyline, but most of the time they don't. Um, whereas in sports, you're at the mercy of the result. So you don't have 100 percent control, but you have but you absolutely there's certain control and you can, you know, you, you are are in control of who you decide is marketable, you know, um, but they still have to, I mean, like when Andreas talked about Sage Northcutt, it was like, it was cool when he was 19 years old and he's a good looking guy and everything. But at the end of the day, he had to perform. And, and when he didn't, you know, Dana, Dana gave up on him too, you know? Um, so, so there's, there's, you know, different issues in, in both, um, you know, but the, the writing is certainly more important in pro wrestling, I think, than in a, in a real sport. Not that this, not that issues don't exist in every sport because they do. And, you know, Vince, Vince has said that one of his heroes is, is Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm not doubting that at all. I, you know, that's the, I, I tr believe that that's to be truthful, but when the proof is in the pudding, um, you know, you don't see uh, a, 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 a lot of African-Americans being pushed to a, a top level. And, and the one that comes back to me and the one that the person who I think is an absolute star and maybe outside of the, the, the new day. I don't know if you ever want to break those guys up because they're so good together, but it is Big E like Big E has every single like Big E checks every single box. It's like it's like the Drew, he's, he's, it's like it's like Big E and Drew McIntyre agile, good workers. Real big and strong, yeah. And, and one's, the person one's in one place and one's in another place, yeah. The yeah. personality, other than the height, other than the height, there is a height difference. But but you but I know what you're saying, yeah. Big E's personality to me is so genuine, and his voice, and just what you know, not that that podcast that, that you did with him, Andreas, was where he was putting on a show or anything. Like it was so genuine and powerful and moving just by him speaking about the topic. I'm watching this going like he should be one of the biggest stars in the company. And I just I don't understand why he's not. Yeah, that, that's an, that's always been interesting. I remember the first time when I was watching Biggie in, in NXT and the five count. And then he makes the main roster and he's, you know, he's instantly thrust into this thing with John Cena for a hot second. And then you look at him and I, the first thing I text one of my friends like this guy's a million bucks. Like you look at him and this is like an easy sell. But the problem was, is they didn't know where, where to put him. Biggie had to develop his own personality alongside the New Day for it to really come out. Because he was at a certain point, and no disrespect to Apollo Crews, but it was like the same guy. It, it was just very bland and there was nothing there. And, I, and it's interesting because I don't know if there was enough people in the writer's room that saw what Big E had and how to channel that and how to turn him into a star because the, the I, I think I, me personally I thought he passed the eye test I thought this was a, a, an easy sell um, but I thought the same thing with Apollo Crews and we see how long it took him to get his hands on the U.S. title um, so I don't I don't know I mean it, it's tough I, I do think you need more people in the room, you know, ultimately, yes, Vince is going to have the final say and you got to deal with like Kevin Dunn. You have to deal with Pritchard. But the more people that you have, the more diverse voices that you have in the room, 
maybe you're able to kind of nudge these things and bring them to fruition. Maybe in the case of like the New Day, maybe if you have bl more black writers, because the New Day can't do everything themselves. The New Day have to deal with what is written for them as well. And I'm sure there's been things that they've shut her down that was like, we would never say this. If you have a white person trying to write for a black voice, it's very difficult. But I think you need that kind of diversity to bring this out and to bring it out in a natural way. Because like you said, Big E is just naturally charismatic. This is just not a show. This is just who he is. And, you know, we, we, you, one thing on, on, on that, one of the issues here is also a mentality of top in the sense of if this was a different era and you had a, a team like this and they have been as a team on top for years and years as a tag team, there's a tag team ceiling in WWE that, they're, that, that you know, doesn't have to be, although they've taught people for, for, for decades which is different from how people were taught in other parts of the country. I mean, even now with, with, you know, again, I'm, this is this, you know, with AEW, I always hear people go like, hey, even with Jim Ross sometimes says this, you know, it's like, well, there's the big monies in the singles. Well, if you, if you teach people that the tag team championship is equal and can headline a pay-per-view and that tag teams are equal, then the, the, the issue with breaking them up or whatever, they could be as a tag team poster boys for the company as opposed to the ceiling. Tag team is down below this, this, and this, and therefore he's a tag team guy. And that, that label itself, he's a tag team guy, kind of says he's a, a great tag team guy means in the public's eye, mid-card to upper mid-card. And, and once you're slotted, and, and the, the, the organization slots you, and the fans do too. They go, up. Oh, he's a... You know, like I'm sure there's people who are going like we're talking about Big E. He's a, a mid card guy because they've seen for whatever it's been eight, nine years. He's a mid card guy. Why are you talking about him like he's a main event guy? Because you're slotted and people in time believe the slot, if you know what I'm saying. There was um, a video that uh, Andres posted about Kofi Kingston and winning the the championship and i will say that when i looked at kofi kingston's title run i looked at it as business right like i don't i never thought they were going to get behind him i never thought they were going to have him beat you know wrestlers conclusively to to put the well, they did they did though but yeah so so when he wins the title i'm like okay like it is what it is but what i didn't realize is what it meant to the, to the perspective of what Andreas has been talking about of culture and equality. And that, you know, that's my own bias looking at it only exclusively from one way. And that video that, that Andreas had, had posted basically with how people were affected by Kofi winning uh, in, in uh, African Americans, that was so moving and enlightening at the same time. Andreas, explain that because I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how people look at Kofi's run, but looking at it from your perspective, like what an amazing moment. Yeah. So I'll tell you the genesis, you know, being at Wally Mania and, and going to WrestleMania that year. Um, when I went to Wally Mania, the outpouring of support for Kofi was unbelievable. And it made me think, I was like, well, damn, you know, if, if he loses... <laughs> I don't think we could take this. I don't think we could take another one. We've had our Booker T. We can't take another one of these. So when he went over and won, and I, I remember I, I'm sitting on the floor, and I think I was a few rows behind Wale and Kaz, who's a good friend of mine. And, you know, you can see when they're getting ready to go home. Like, you can see it. And you're like, this is really happening. And I turned to Keller, who was sitting next to me, and I could see the look on his face. And I started looking around the crowd because I'm always really big on crowd reaction. Like, when I watch Pops, like, when I watch big moments in pro wrestling, I always watch the crowd. It's very important to me. And when Kofi won, the look on Kofi's face, the look on E and Austin's face, and then I looked at the people, and I was like, this is unbelievable because it's hitting us in a way that a lot of us didn't even expect us to hit, it, hit that way emotionally. So what I did is I put out a tweet, and I was like, hey, if you guys got reaction videos of Kofi winning the title, please send them my way. And I thought I'd get, like, 20 30. I got like a thousand videos. Oh my wow. God. And, wow. And I was getting videos from people at WrestleMania, people watching at home, a friend of mine who was at Disneyland who stopped what she was doing at Disneyland to watch WrestleMania. 
And there was people, then I got videos from the Philippines, I got videos from Ireland, I got videos from Australia. And it became this thing that it was a universal love of seeing somebody who works so hard, a genuinely good guy that nobody's ever had anything bad to say about, who happens to be a black man in America winning the title. And those reactions with people just overwhelmed with emotion and crying. And there was just so much. And like one of the videos I hated that I, I couldn't get in there was uh, MVP and JTG when they were watching it. And it was just like that kind of visceral reaction is one of those things that you can't really gauge, you know, if, if, if you don't really understand the culture. And we needed that moment. And now when you talk about the title run, yes, we all kind of said the same thing. Well, this has got to end sooner or later. Uh, when is Brock going to beat him? Because that was like the overwhelming thought is like once Brock gets him in there, he's probably going to beat him. The only problem that a lot of us had with Brock beating him is how easily it was done when the storyline was, well, you squashed me at Beast in the East. I'm going to come back and make this competitive. And it wasn't at all. And it made the whole title run feel like an afterthought. But fortunately, yeah. we just had that moment. And I, I don't, I'll, I'll be honest, when, when Kofi hit me and he said, you know, I couldn't believe the reaction I got to this video. When you're in the wrestling bubble, sometimes you don't realize the importance of what you're doing and how it affects people. And I think that goes for the people in the writer's room. I think that goes for Vince. Yeah, you see crowd reaction, but you don't really understand visceral and emotional reaction. And I think that was one of those moments that, again, people needed to see because it wasn't just black people who, were, who reacted like this. This was people across the world who just saw somebody who should have had an opportunity to finally get it and take full advantage and win on the biggest stage. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, I saw a lot of similarities with the Kofi Kingston as with Daniel Bryan a couple of years earlier in the sense that, you know, neither of those two things were, were planned in the sense of when, when they got to November, December, January, we got to plan WrestleMania. In both cases, there were probably, there was a, I mean, there was a plan for Daniel Bryan to be in a nothing match, and I don't even know what the plan for Kofi was at that point that year. And things just happened you know, guys got hurt, guys left. Um, there were scenarios and they exploded in popularity. And, you know, in both cases, had they not won, it would have been, you know, promotional malpractice practically because it was so obvious the based on the momentum and everything, what should have happened. And, and you know, to the credit of the company, they, they picked up on it where they, in, in the Daniel Bryan case, I think once they recognized it, it was that way all the way. Whereas with Kofi, it definitely changed several times. I mean, as far as like what they were going to do. I mean, I don't think that even when he got hot, the plan was for actually him to win because Owens was supposed to be in WrestleMania. And then Vince saw, hey, I'm going to flip it. I'm going to, you know, Owens will be the guy who's the setup guy because Kofi was going to be the setup guy for Owens and we're going to go in the different direction. And then at that point, Kofi had to win. But even when he won, I mean, the day after he won, I go, great pop but it's going to be Daniel Bryan, you know, I mean, Daniel Bryan's thing ended because he was injured early, but, but the goal, you know, for Daniel Bryan was, is we're going to give the people the feel good moment. And then we're going to kick his ass with Brock, who was going to do the, the one-sided squash match of him, you know, which not quite seven seconds, but it was going to be a one-sided squash match. And, and the, you know, everyone will know who the real guy is. And that was just your, you know, we gave you guys the bone to feel good, but he didn't really at that level you know, mentalities. And, and with Kofi, I knew that that was going to be it when it was over. And then when it was over, it was like right back to where he was, as opposed to, you know, most other people, uh, if they have a four or five month successful run and it was successful, um, you, you maintain your status even as not champion anymore. Obviously he was going to lose the championship and he was going to, you know, he was going to lose it during, you know, whenever it was, he was going to lose it. That wasn't even, a, that wasn't a question, but it was the, once once it was over, it was kind of like now everything is back to the way it was supposed to be in their minds. And I thought, wait a minute, didn't he just get over? Didn't he kind of establish that he's at a higher level now? And I think that was my frustration was the day he won it. I thought this is exactly how what's going to happen. And then six months later, it was like, well, that's exactly what happened. So it was, it's it's kind of like... Um, they gave it's like they gave you a moment, but they really but they but it wasn't what they wanted. And and I think that in, in hindsight, with time, you saw at the end, it's like, well, this wasn't what we wanted. So we just gave them their moment, to, you know, but it didn't it didn't change anything, so to speak. Yeah, you know, I'll say this also. I think the, the biggest the biggest thing out of all that is when Kofi lost the title the next week, he shows up and he does he mentions it. He doesn't even talk about it. It, what could it he never becomes 
he does, there was no conversation about Kofi wanting to get the title back, winning again, being champion again. He was like thrust right back in the mid card. And I think for a lot of us, we were like, well, where's the anger? Where's the frustration? Where's the get back? Yep. It, it's exactly what you mentioned, Dave. It was like, you got your moment, you got a few months run out of this, and now let's go back to our original plan. And that still remains frustrating because it kind of tells us, like, cool, you got it because of the momentum, but, yeah, we're going to go back to the way things were. Well, it's it's. I think that it's a, it's a, it's like the larger picture in the sense of because it was the same with Daniel Bryan. It's not necessarily a, a, a race issue as much as a perception issue from the company in the sense of we know better than you. We know we know he's not a top guy, but since there's a momentum to it and the people really want it, we'll give it to him. But you know everything will revert back to normal once this little thing ends. And and I think that that was kind of the situation, you know, in 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 both cases. But even. Even with Brian, at least, you know, he, you know, I can't say that they pushed him as a top guy, but if he loses a championship match, he's still in there. He's still cutting the promo. Like with Kofi, it's like you said, like, you know, why didn't he say anything? And of course, the reason he couldn't is because what's he going to say? They're not going to put him in that position anyway. They've already decided that it was it was the the fluke that the fans wanted, but it's not the right thing in, in their mind. So but yeah, I was really I mean, and, and now I will say this. I was very, I, I wasn't surprised. I, I was surprised, of course, obviously, that he lost in seven seconds. I wasn't surprised that he lost. I wasn't surprised that he was sort of put back in that same position. But I didn't think it would be so abrupt. I thought that, okay, he's going to lose the title. He's going to have, um, you know, he'll have his rematches. Then he'll have, you know, kind of, you know, intercontinental, but also he'll be in the tag team because you really don't want to split them up. And, and you know, there should always be in the tag team picture anyway. And it'll be a gradual thing. I mean, this was literally a one day thing. He went from being world champion to uh, exactly where he was before with, without even a, um, you know, a time frame or, a, you know, it was just like there. We're, we're kind of pull you out of the main event thing as opposed to a gradual thing. Thing. I mean, I thought this is it's going to end up I always thought it was going to end up where he is, where he was, but I didn't think it would be abrupt like, you know, Thursday he's here and then Saturday he's exactly where he, you know, Thursday he's on top and Saturday he's where he was nine months ago. That was so abrupt. That was that 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 did surprise me. So I um I have met I met Kenny King at Wale Mania in I think I believe it was in New Orleans. And I am a fan of the uh, the Bachelor franchise, so kind of mixing Kenny King in with the Bachelor franchise was actually pretty cool to me. And I had asked him, you know, this is uh, several years ago. I said, "Would you ever want to be the Bachelor?" And he said that he saw everything that Rachel Lindsay had gone through as the Bachelorette, meaning there was lots of negativity via folks who are racist who didn't think she should have been the bachelorette and he said you know he needs to protect his family and he has a he has a daughter and and i mean he didn't say he wouldn't do it but he said those are the things that that would uh you know kind of make him think twice about it and i've always held that conversation because i I, it gave me an interesting perspective that i didn't realize which is as much as you want to push the conversation there's lots of people trying to pull that conversation back because they want it to be you know the way that they want it and it reminded me of you know the moment the 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 things that you're doing andre is having the conversations on twitter doing the the stuff with with the new day like are you are you getting negativity from that as well or has it been mostly people supporting you and and being you know and, and really thanking you for for creating awareness around this i would say it's maybe 80 20. there's always going to be the naysayers on twitter like why are you doing this why are you trying to politicize what i love or what have you why are you trying to bring race into the picture race doesn't matter and it's, i'm colorblind what have you but for the most that's, part, <laughs> it, it's cr- it's crazy, but they exist, and that's kind of you know we have Donald Trump the, as the, our president. The, the, so the colorblind thing is so it's oh my god. I mean, it's, I it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it's it's like it's it's not about it's like it's like look at the big look at the big picture. The world's not colorblind, even if you think you are. You know what I mean? You know, so yeah. yeah. So it's it's always been one of those things where yeah, I know I'm gonna have to take my lumps with it. I know there's people there's people that unfollow me on Twitter all the time when I start talking about race in anything, um, and it, and I don't I've tried to be 
purposeful in making not this not an angry topic. Just let's have these conversations. Let's acknowledge that there are cultural differences in this country. And there are things that make us different and we should celebrate each other for our differences. Some people just don't want any part of that. But for the most part, I would, like I would say 80 percent would say, thank you for doing this. And I think of that 80, there has been maybe half of that that said, I didn't realize what was going on. I, I just wasn't aware. Thank you for at least bringing this to the forefront so I can educate myself. And that's all I want to do is push that conversation forward. So to take kind of bring it full circle back to, to the New Day show, I think um, one, of, one of the things that is that that was really enlightening was just the fact that, um, you know, Dave mentioned Austin or Xavier Woods, how um, how well he, he has done in his own life w- with the things that he's accomplished. And the thing that stuck in my head is that he said every time he leaves the house he, in his head, he creates a plan of action in case he is attacked. And, wow. you know, I. I have thought similarly, but it has been mostly because there are certain sections where I grew up where, um, you know, probably not the best area like for me to go to high school and stuff. So in a sense, that toughened me. And but I did think that way when I was 14. But I can't imagine thinking that way as an adult. Um, And, you know, I don't know if there's really anything to say about that, but but that was uh, something that I has stuck with me since the moment that he said that, and uh, I just it's just an amazing thing to think about. There's something I want to bring up. I saw, you know, and I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, but it was it was actually from him, and it was it, it had to do with a Klan rally that was I think he said 60 miles from his home, I believe, and I was just looking at this going like, you know, here he is, you know, I mean, how 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 you know. How, I mean, I, you know, obviously furious, of course, but it's like, especially, and especially the time frame, you know, but any time frame, it, it wouldn't matter the time frame. I mean, it was, I guess, to some people it would be worse because of, it was a couple of weeks ago, but even if it was last year, you know, I mean, it's like, you're, you know, you've got a family and you're, you know, whatever. And this, you know, this stuff that's absolutely inexcusable still exists and you can't like say it doesn't, you know what I mean? And it's. It's like, you know, even if it's 60 miles from your home, it's the fact is it's like it's it's in your state. You know what I mean? And it's it's not that far. And it's like and it's it's like it's it, that was like a level of ugliness that was just like, you know, that he like you and I, you know, Brian, Garrett and I, not you, and Andreas. But I mean, there's there's stuff that we would have to deal with. But could you I, I mean, I couldn't even that, that was one where it's like, oh, my God, what if like they did that with you know, whatever with us, you know, flip the switch. And it's just like, you know, I mean, I, I, it was almost like, how is this even allowed? How are these people, you know, how, how could these people think the way they do to do this? You know, it's like, you know, I mean, we all deal with ignorance on a daily basis, but I was just like, um, I guess, you know, knowing this, but seeing, you know, thinking about a guy, you know, in, in 2020, it was, it just, it brought out so much like, um, hatred in me and sadness in me um and and i think in anyone who probably watched it would have the same you know impression um that you know here you are and you know you've accomplished a whole 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 lot in life and then look at this it's look look at this it's still happening and you know you're you know it's it's not 30 years ago it's 2020 and people are supposed to be more enlightened and, and here it is it's right there yeah you know that that struck me as well when when, he, when Xavier mentioned that on the uh, the podcast, because it's something that we as African Americans do and we don't even realize we're doing it because we're kind of predisposed to the idea that something may happen and we may need to protect ourselves, and it may it won't happen because of who we are. It'll be it'll happen because of what we look like, and I think that's always been the scary thing because when you look at Xavier Woods and you look at his background, you look at he's he's. A very nice person. Like if you meet him, you know, he's a very nice individual just genuinely. But when the cops pull him over, they don't get to find that out before something happens. So and that's always the scariest thing, because like I have a nephew who's 14, who is the kind, kindest, cuddliest kid ever. But he happens to be 6'2 and 220 pounds. 
And I've seen people look at him a certain way and I'm like, and I have to prepare him for life to say, if this happens, this is what you have to do. This is, you know, this is the procedure. And I'm so predisposed to it. I don't recognize how for some people like you, Dave, that you don't, you couldn't fathom that, but it's ingrained in us. It's a defense mechanism that is scary when other people bring it to my attention that this is what we have to do. And it, like when you say, I can't fathom you doing that, I'm like, well, I can, because this is what I've done my whole life. But then it's, wow, wouldn't life be so much easier if I didn't have to carry that weight? I wish that life would, you know, that we didn't have to concern ourselves with these things. And to bring it all full circle, it's like, that's kind of why we did that podcast. That's kind of why I've had these conversations with wrestling with stereotypes. I want people to understand, like, we just want equality. We just want to be treated like everybody else. I don't want to have to tell my nephew if you get pulled over with one of your friends, this is what you have to do and this is what might happen. Or I don't want to have to worry about, like, if I say something about this, you know, I don't want to have to have a Bubba Wallace situation where there may be a noose in my garage and I have to be extremely sensitive to this because of the history of this country. It's, and then turn you and then turn you in, and then and then people turn you into the villain for it for somehow somehow. Exactly. And that's the scariest thing is like when I bring up race and like I said, there's a 20 percent of people who get really upset with me, even though I do it in a very disarming way for the most part, unless you attack me with ignorance. But if I do it in a very disarming way, people still don't want to hear it because people still want to act like it doesn't exist. And there is a superiority complex in America that still exists today that some people will just not let go of. Fortunately, there is has been progress through education and teaching the language of love instead of hate does go a long way. And when you see the new day having fun and, and just be having a good time and you can relate to those characters, those people on TV, because they're fun, they wear bright colors and, and you forget for a second, like, oh, well, they can be whatever they want to be. They don't have to play the heel role. They don't have to do these things. It's acceptable for us to be who we are. We can be video gamers like Xavier Woods. We can like Biggie loves boxing and loves MMA. We can do all of these things. Just don't treat us different. That's all. We just want to hang out in the same rooms with you guys and not have to worry about having to disarm you once we walk into a room because you are worried about who we are. So the, the, I think it's a great way and, and, and we'll end it here in a second. But I think the thing I wanted to, to just lastly mention is, you know, there are going to be people who listen to the show who are like, oh, you know, why can't you you just entertain me about happy things? And, and I get that. Like, you know, the world is a, a tough place to be if you're being really thoughtful about the things that are going on. And, you know, spe- especially these you, w- with the with the coronavirus. Um, you know, there's also been a movement from uh, women in wrestling about speaking out. Those are all heavy stories. All this, at once. this, yeah. but this story didn't just start like like Andre has mentioned w- with George Floyd. And so, the, you know, I want to make sure that you know people who do listen to this show understand that the world is full of heaviness if you're being thoughtful about things and if you're being empathetic to people. And so, you know, I hope that people have, you know, gotten some some good information, some perspective from Andreas here, uh, because I think it's it's necessary. And and then the last thing I wanted to ask you, Andreas, is we live in it. We live in a society where everyone's ready to move on to the next topic and to the next topic and the next topic. What, what are you what do you plan to do to keep all of these thoughts and, and all of these things, you know, with what you're doing in social media and, and, and just in general, like how, how do you keep, how do we all keep the discussion moving forward and, and in, in the public eye? Well, I think for one, I mean, cause for me, this has always been, no matter what I do and what I've done in my career as a journalist, as an editor, what have you, this has always been something that I've, I've brought to the forefront and I will continue to do so. So things like wrestling with stereotypes wasn't created as a hot button topic. It was created as a legacy brand because it's something that I want these conversations to continue w- even when the situation is not at the forefront. Because stereotypes is not just with African-Americans. It, we deal with other minorities in this country. We deal with sexual orientation. So these things happen. And I, I think that for myself, I'm going to keep having these conversations where I feel like they're needed to be had. It's not going to be uh, 24 hours, seven days a week dominated by race and, and this heavy topic because I like to have fun, too. But I will keep these things going. I think we all need to do the same. I do think we need to look at our sports and our, our entertainment and find the things that are, you know, that are people are being disservice and, and not getting enough of and have these conversations. Just be open to them because, dude, it happens 
almost every day where I come across something that's, you know, racially insensitive or uh, sexually insensitive or just plain ignorant. And I think in order for us to keep moving forward, we can't turn a blind eye to these things. And we need to be open and willing to have these conversations. And no matter who we are, um, it may make us feel very uncomfortable, but I think that's the only way we can get past it because otherwise we'll be right back in the same spot five years from now. And hopefully, and it's something I mentioned with the New Day, hopefully through these conversations, we're kind of ushering in the next generation of pro wrestling fans, the next generation of attorneys, the next generation of judges, next generation of police who want to see the world change and hopefully they can be inspired to do so. And the only way you can do that is by continuing to have these conversations no matter what. So where can people find you? Uh, Corner Podcast, Twitter, all the other things that you're doing. Wh- wh- where can they get their, uh, if, if they want to read more from you or just you know see what you're doing? Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm the senior editor of Combat Sports at The Zone and Sporting News. So you can find my writing at both The Zone News and Sporting News. And when boxing comes back, you'll see me on The Zone as well. Uh, at Twitter, at Andreas Hale, same with on Instagram. Uh, the Corner Podcast uh, you can find that on anywhere that you get your podcast at. And then hopefully when the world finds some semblance of normalcy, we'll be doing wrestling with stereotypes again. So I think, yeah, I think I hit the nail on the head. There's all the places. And then music wise, you got L O cool J's rock the bells. I still write for billboard. So genius in a few other places. <laughs> All right. Th- thanks again, man. And, and when you guys thanks, do Andrews. do the, the wrestling with stereotypes uh, panel, I'm definitely going to be there, uh, hopefully in the front row. And uh, I, the, it's just it's just tremendous work. And people go find the YouTube video of, of the other panel and, you know, find find some of the stuff that Andres has done. Thanks again, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So for Andres and Dave, I'm Garrett. And to everyone, thanks for listening.